Good morning year 10. So in today's lesson we're going to have a go at resolving some forces um, which should lead on quite nicely from the little bit of maths we did last lesson. So I had you doing basically resolving forces last lesson but just doing the calculations from the angles. So hopefully that will lead itself to quite nicely to what we're going to do today. Let's adjust the angle there. I'm a bit backlit but anyway. Um, so resolution of forces so we're, we're quite comfortable i think generally with the idea that if we had two forces acting on a line um, then we could resolve that we could work out what the resultant force was so we would know therefore that if it was three newtons acting in one direction the opposite direction seven newtons then the resultant force is four newtons in this direction so if it's on the, the same line that's really quite straightforward the problem comes when we have uh, forces that act in different directions um, this does however lend itself to us being able to go backwards so if for example on this diagram i gave you this four newton force and said can you resolve this can you work out what two forces led to that well just from the information that there's a four newton force acting in this direction overall um, I can't work out what two forces resulted in that resultant force just from that piece of information however if that force was acting at an angle so if I had my four Newton force, that really should definitely come from the middle of the circle. If I have my four Newton force acting at an angle, say, of 30 degrees, I haven't left my spell space for that, 30 degrees, to the um, horizontal, then if it was moving four newtons the four newton force actually in this direction <coughs> i can actually go some way towards working out well i can entirely work out i can resolve that into two forces acting at right angle to one another so two perpendicular forces that could lead to a four newton force now that's not necessarily what led to that force but if i tell you that i know there were two perpendicular forces that led to that four newton force you could work out what those were just by knowing the angle and knowing that four newtons and i know you can do that because you did it last lesson now you could do that mathematically i know but that's not what you're asked to do at gcse uh, science you're asked to draw it so just remember that if you do it mathematically you wouldn't get the marks if what they've asked for is a scale drawing so in your exam you'll need to take in a protractor a ruler and you would be given this on some sort of squared paper or graph paper on the on the um, question paper um, if you're expected to do it to, to a really good scale because then it's just like we did last time what you're doing is you're resolving it into a horizontal and a vertical component so you can therefore just draw that out as a scale diagram and measure those two lines and knowing the scale that was used you can work out those two components of the force so um let's do a few examples of this so what i'm going to do is i'm going to work through a few examples and then i will give you um some to do and and then i'll go through them one at a time with you So let's just think about what that could look like as a question then. So for example, what you could have is a car and you could say that this car is traveling in this direction and there is wind acting on the car um, with a force of 500 newtons at an angle of 30 degrees to the car. And what I want to know is what component of that force will slow the car down so what component of that force is acting in the same direction, um, the opposite direction, sorry, to the direction of travel of the car. So in order to work that out, I need to draw a scale diagram. Oh, my desk is such a mess. Okay, scale diagram. So I'm going to draw first the line 
and again like I said really ideally what you're going to have here is a piece of square paper so I've got my line and then I'm going to measure 30 degrees to the line using my protractor and I'm going to use a scale of one centimeter is going to be 100 newtons so therefore my line goes up to here so I then I'm going to measure 90 degrees down from my line so therefore if this is 500 newtons this is 30 degrees what is this distance here I've resolved the horizontal component of the force and I found that it's 4.5 centimetres therefore it's 450 newtons so it's just very similar to what you were doing uh, yesterday now I think what some of you got a bit confused by was then when we decided to, to look at questions where um, it's an object on a slope and that's quite often what they use in these are objects on slopes so therefore I'm going to give you a few examples of those to practice because I think that first example I will give you one of those first examples again but in that first example it's reasonably straightforward um, but the object on a slope gets more difficult so if I draw myself an object on a slope um, Um, and we could imagine that this object might be a car going up a hill or could just be a box on a slope. So the different forces acting on it, I can, I can work out and I can resolve things from that. The one that generally is used, remember, forces always come from the centre of mass of an object. So therefore, I've given a dot on the centre of mass there and at 90 degrees... I'm going to draw a down arrow and I'm going to label that as weight. So that was, is the downward force due to gravity due to the mass um, of this object. And that will always act straight down to the centre of the earth. So the thing about this though is that it has two effects to that weight. It has the effect of holding the object to the surface. So it has a downward force on the surface, but it also has um, an element of it that is parallel to the surface that is, is causing it to, to make it harder to push this box up the, the slope. It's, it would, if there was no friction, it would mean that the box would then slowly slide down the slope. So if there's no friction, it would go very rapidly down the slope, of course. So, um, so those two components I can resolve if I know the weight, I can resolve those two other components from that. And I can do that simply by doing um, the same as I, I have done um, in, in the diagram previously, by having a component that it is, you see I'm lining up, that up with 90 degrees on my protractor. Um, there's a component of it that is acting um, at 90 degrees to the slope and there is a component of it that is acting parallel to the slope and if this was a scale diagram and I'd measured that weight exactly I could then use that to I should be using doing this properly shouldn't I so that you can see at exactly 90 degrees to that then I then have my two components, the component acting this way and the component acting this way. I could have drawn it into a rectangle and shown this distance here. It really makes no difference. It's exactly the same, just as long as you make sure your drawing is exactly to scale. So those are the two components I can resolve it to. I think the reason we get a little bit confused by this is because we... we we can't work out what those, where am I going to put the other two lines. But if you just go back to the theory and what those two lines represent, I think it should become more straightforward. Sometimes I see people also in the exams actually just turning their page around so that once they have drawn in that 90 degree to the slope, 
that first line that people tend to draw in the line of the force acting down on the box on the slope then that's your bottom line of the triangle that you've been drawing when you were practicing yesterday so maybe that'll help it to feel a little bit, a little bit more familiar to you um you would have to be given this angle to be able to draw this as a scale diagram and you'd have to be given this distance also to be drawn to draw this as a scale diagram so you need two bits of information to be able to do this calculation well scale diagram and work out those values <coughs> so let's do some examples so the first example i want you to try then is i want you to draw a scale diagram please um of an object on a slope and i want this angle to be 30 degrees please and i want the weight of the object to be 50 newtons so i've used a scale of one centimeter is equal to one newton so that's a five centimeter line going down from the object and the component i want is the one parallel to the slope so i want to know what component of this force is acting parallel to the slope so pause this now, complete your diagram, do your measurements and I'll run through the answer with you. OK, so the way I do this is always the same, as I said, is I always start with that perpendicular component because I can get that by getting a 90 degree angle from the slope and I can draw myself a line here which is going to be the direction of the uh, perpendicular component I can then simply take a 90 degree from that and get the parallel component and I can just get my ruler out and measure the parallel component of the force which is 2.5 centimetres, which is equal to 25 newtons. OK, let's try another one in case you didn't quite get that. So these are the questions I'm using. So we've just done question one. Question two then, I'm not going to give you so much help. So a car with a weight of 12 kilonewtons is driving up a slope of an angle of 10 degrees. Calculate the component of the weight acting down the slope. So again, we're just doing the same one, the same parallel to the slope force um, using a scale diagram. So pause the video, draw yourself a scale diagram, and then I'll run through that with you. OK, so first of all, I will get my slope drawn. So I need a angle of 10. So I get my protractor, get myself a slope with an angle of 10. And then I'll put my box anywhere I like on it to represent the car. And its weight is 12 kilonewtons. Oh, I have big regrets about where I've put this because I've not got a lot of space, have I? So my scale is going to have to be pitifully small. No, do you know what? I'm just going to pause and draw this again on the next page and you'll have to... Okay, so the weight, it says, is 12 kilonewtons. So I need to make sure my weight is acting straight down. I should really use my protractor, shouldn't I, to get an exact 90 degrees there? Uh, so I'm going to use one centimetre is one kilonewton so that's my 12 kilonewtons of weight so now I'm going to resolve this so that I get the um, component going down the slope in order to do that the first thing I do is I draw on the component acting perpendicular so I get my 90 degrees and I draw that on like so so that I can get this line drawn accurately when you look on a mark scheme for these sorts of questions it does have a range of answers so whilst they are pretty hot on exact you being exact 
um, they are aware that it is difficult to measure you know you, at the end of the day you've got a ruler that measures the nose millimeter your protractor <coughs> measures the nose degree we've got to be realistic about what's possible so that component of the force is i would say gosh i don't know where you'll get 1.9 or 2 i'll say it's 2 kilonewtons but you would get one either way definitely on that Okay, the last of these three questions is much more challenging. So this time you've got a box on a slope with an angle of 20 degrees, but now it's saying the frictional force acting down the slope, so that force acting against the movement of the slope, um, preventing the box from slipping is 60 newtons. You need to calculate the weight of the box. So this time you've got the, the force parallel to the box. Um, it's at rest, so therefore friction is, is uh, balanced with the force um, of the box on the slope so therefore you need to calculate the weight of the box again by drawing out your diagram drawing in the force perpendicular that that line perpendicular and seeing if you can work out the weight of the box and i'll run that through so pause now and have a go at that one okay so i've done the easy bit um I've got my 20 degree slope. It's saying that the force acting down the slope is 60 newtons. So I need to make that oops, parallel to the slope. And I'm going to try to keep it simple and try to keep my one centimeter is a newton so that it's a bit easier. So one centimeter in this case, sorry, is 10 newtons. And so there I have my frictional force of 60 newtons so as ever i'm going to approach it like the other questions and the first thing i'm going to draw in is going to be the force perpendicular to that um, remembering that what i'm actually trying to get is the weight of the box which is acting straight down my diagram so if i draw that like this there we go what I can then do is equally draw that on the other end there. So I'm forming myself a nice parallelogram, a nice box. Um, and I'll talk around this in a second, because if what I'm aiming for here, and this has to be at exactly 90 degrees, so this line needs to be at right angles acting straight down, doesn't it, the weight? So this is the line I'm trying to work out the length of. Well, the length of that line is going to be wherever this line crosses it. Now, if I've got a true parallelogram here, obviously equally, Instead of drawing this line, I could just have drawn across this way, couldn't I? But I, for some reason, that, that I find that quite difficult in my head to get my head around. It's just easier for me if I stick to keeping my diagram looking like I'm used to. So I can then, if I want to, complete it down here and across here so that it looks like, again, I ought to measure that to be exactly 90. So that should be right, shouldn't it? Um, so it looks like that parallel of forces that I'm used to seeing in this diagram. I can then measure the length of this line here. And in this case, I'm getting it to be 18.5. So 185 newtons is the weight of this box. I do think it's like anything that if we've got a, a sequence that we go through each time, it just becomes so much easier. So I'd really recommend that you you use the same sequence each time because then it just gets to the point where you can see it much more clearly. So in the book, there are some questions that uh, I'd like you to have a go at and then I'll run through the answers to them. Um, I'll be running through the answers at the end, so if you would prefer to do them one at a time and then watch the video answers, then that's absolutely fine. Otherwise, if you want to go through them all, um, 
the questions are here so you might want to pause and look at the questions but there are uh, it's on page 131 of the physics textbook of caboodle so there's it, it, it's it talks through this concept in here as well there are some diagrams to go with um some of the questions so here it's question one the aircraft one is in figure six and this is figure six here so that's that very first question that we tried where it's a nice simple triangle that we're used to um, question two you have to do your own diagram and question three then um, has a diagram figure seven but to be honest I'm sure you're able to do it without the figure because you're given the the weight and the the angle so you could have done that anyway so pause have a go at those and then I will go through the answers not very in focus that's better pause okay so for that first question then you should have drawn a diagram that looks a bit like this and therefore the um, component of the wind force along the line that the aircraft is moving should be around about 700 newtons. Question two, you should have ended up with a, a diagram that looks a bit like this without my 15 degree slope and a weight of 510 which then I can draw on my first line I always draw my first line as the one acting down on the slope and then I can draw in my second line at 90 degrees to it parallel to the slope and they're asking for the weight down the slope so therefore it's 1.5 centimeters or one hundred and fifty newtons the answer in the book for that was 130 newtons so hmm, it'd be interesting to see what you all get for that maybe i didn't do my diagram terribly well um the next question asked if the force exerted by the student was greater than the answer why so if there's a force of 150 newtons acting down the slope due to the weight in order to push up the hill why have they had to exert a force greater than 150 newtons there are two reasons for that friction is the obvious answer um, but also it's possible that they weren't pushing parallel to the slope and therefore the entire force that they're pushing wouldn't uh, affect the direction of movement up the slope um, so that's another possible answer to that question. Question three, why a ladder placed against a wall would slide down the wall if the floor was too slippery? So not enough friction means that the weight of the ladder would pull the ladder down. And question four is another one where I'll pause here and draw that for you. Okay, there's my box at rest on this slope. As ever, I'm going to start with always do these in pencil the only reason i'm not is because i'm worried that it might not show up so well under the visualizer and also it doesn't give me the opportunity to need to use different colors which might help you to see what i'm doing a bit better but in the exam do always use pencil for these won't you so that you can rub it out if you make a mistake because it would be very frustrating in the exam to make a mistake because you only really have one diagram to draw on <coughs> so then if i measure these two lines Sorry, I didn't make that clear, did I, that that was my 50 newtons. I used 5 centimetres. So therefore, that is 43 newtons I make it. Or 44 newtons, somewhere on there. And this was, oh gosh, 24 newtons, 25 newtons, somewhere around there. <coughs> The final question asked me to describe the friction between the box and the slope. Well, if this box is at rest, then the friction that's acting on the box, acting on the box, must be equal to 24 newtons 
and in the opposite direction. So therefore, if the 24 Newton force is acting down the slope, I must have a 24 Newton force of friction acting up the slope for it to not be moving. I must have balance forces. OK, I think that'll do us for today's lesson. So if you could take a photo of your work and upload that to show my homework just so I can see if there's any bits that you're you're not quite getting that I haven't explained well enough that you're you know making any consistent errors then I can work on what to do next with that. But I hope that made sense to you now. Thank you.